Welcome to TAP, whether you are a therapist or an astrologer or someone who's just smart enough to care about wholeness and how to remember our innate wholeness, you are in the category of having a nervous system. So today we will talk about something that's directly related to you, no matter who you are, because we all have that nervous system. And I'm so honored and to, to welcome you, Justin Sinceri, uh, to this podcast to talk to us about the nervous system. Uh, first of all, welcome. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm super happy to be here and I'm glad you invited me. Thank you. Oh, man. So uh, I'm sure that you recall how you feel when you've interviewed Stephen Porges and Deb Dana. That's sort of how I feel now. Oh, <laughs> seriously? It's like, yeah, it's like, oh. I, I know I cannot be filled after this conversation, but I'm going to try my best and I have a plan for us. But first of all, let me okay. just introduce you to the listeners. Um, so you have this, you say this quite a bit that uh, you are a licensed marriage and family therapist obsessed with the polyvagal theory. And yeah. just to introduce you also in my own words, I really admire you as a podcaster. Uh, you have the podcast stuck, but not broken. Uh, built on the polyvagal theory and very unlike TAP, Therapeutic Astrology Podcast, it's, it, this is really built on that. So it's, it's a very yeah. clear uh, content. And uh, even though it is only about the polyvagal theory, there is so much to it. You do a yeah. great job of, I feel, you know, covering so many subjects. Yeah. So what I thought we'll do today is I'm gonna start with an intro question, and then after that, I thought to um, ask you about different topics, and then you can say how the polyvagal theory understanding of the state is underlying that diagnosis okay. uh, story. Would you be up for okay. that little game? I'll do the best I can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Good. So it is the topic is our biology under our mental state that is kind of the frame and my first question is if you could describe and explain the polyvagal ladder and where we are on sure. it where you think that i am on it and where you are on it and where the listeners <laughs> are on it that's not i'm not gonna say <laughs> give it I'm your not best i'm gonna say where you're at on it i don't, I don't know you well enough and <laughs> that would uh, fall too close into diagnosis and, and whatnot. So I'll, I'll pass on that, but I'll invite you to talk about yourself if you like, as far as where you're at on it. Um, so, well, to understand the polyvagal ladder, you have to understand polyvagal states and understand that. I think we'll just lightly touch upon what polyvagal theory is in general. Is that a good place to start? Yes, absolutely. All right, I love your setup, by the way, super cozy. <laughs> So the polyvagal theory, ever so briefly, is the science of connection. It's the science of uh, the nervous system, how we respond to danger and safety. And it, it says that our bodies can be in a state of safety uh, or danger. I mean, just a bit of super, super, super simply, that's usually what people take from it. It's way more deep than that and talks about the vagus nerve and two different patterns two different parasympathetic nervous systems, all stuff. But I think just for what people typically want to know, it's that's says it I mean, a lot right there. Right. Yeah. So safety or danger to take a step further, our bodies can be in a state of danger, uh, but more specifically flight fight, which is one state, the sympathetic state flight, fight, shut down or freeze as, as, a uh, the danger states. So safety flight, fight, shut down or freeze. So though we have the polyvagal theory, just super in general, and then we understand there are different states of the body that correspond with safety or danger. So when we're safe, we can do things like kick back and put our arms up and smile and laugh and record a podcast. Um, and we're good, right? No danger, no threats. We're okay. We can make eye contact if we were in person. Uh, we can hug loved ones. We can smile. That, that's our safety state. If we can't be safe, then we shift into flight fight. And that would be, you know, eyes go wide, we are mobilized, heart rate is up, we take off 
to get space like we run away, or we use aggression to get the danger to back off so that we can then run away. And if we can't, uh, be, if we can't be safe, can't run away, can't fight the danger, then we go into shutdown, which is a limp collapse. We immobilize limply, or we uh, immobilize stiffly, tensely, and that would be freeze. Okay, so those are the polyvagal states. And we've already started talking about how we shift through them in a sequence from safety to flight fight, but it's really flight and then fight, and then shut down or, or freeze. So that's part of the ladder is we start at the top ideally, which is on our safety state. And if we can't be safe, we go down into flight, down further to fight, and then down into shut down or freeze. But we can get stuck there. And that, that's really what trauma is, being stuck in a defensive state. So to go up the polyvagal ladder, you have to do the reverse. You have to come out of freeze or shut down and then come up into one well, and freeze. We'll take a moment to sidestep here. Freeze is a combination of shutdown and flight fight. It's a combination of sympathetic plus immobilized shutdown. So you're immobilized, but also really highly charged for mobilization at the same time. It's like slamming on the brake and accelerator of your car at the same time. Okay, so we have to come out of shutdown or freeze and then go up into a uh, flight fight and then up into safety. We have to go down and then back up in the reverse order. So that's that's the ladder. You climb up a ladder and die, down a ladder. You can't really skip. You kind of have to go up and down in a sequence. And the polyvagal theory hypothesizes that. Our bodies do the same thing. Our, our nervous system has to go through these shifts, uh, prioritizing our body for safety, for defense, and then coming out of it in the reverse order. That's the basic idea. Mm. Are you going to pass on where we are? Did, did you say? Say it again? Where, did you, are you going to pass on the question about where we are, the letter? Where oh, well, I, I kind of touched upon it. You tell me where, where you're at, but if, if we're able to smile and and laugh and think critically, then yeah, we're, we're in our safety state. I know for me, I'm pretty well anchored in my safety state. Um, I have a little flight energy. Whenever I do these things, I get a little anxious, but not overwhelming. So I'm mostly well anchored in my safety state with a little bit of flight activation that keeps me, you know, mobilized, but mostly yes. comes out as playfulness rather than, you know, anxiety. Yeah. How about you? Where, where, do you, where do you think you're at? Yeah, no, I was just thinking when you said it looks cozy here, maybe you're just so attuned to looking for safe spaces right? Yeah. That's what I hear in your podcast. You're always inviting yeah. to find safe spaces. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, but this is going to bring us, I think, to the next topic because... Wait, wait, where, where are you at on your Yeah, phone? yeah, I am I am answering. I'm just ahead of myself um, <laughs> because it's, it's I want to go to the mixed state and I think that's when I, when yeah. I get excited like this, I mean, I'm definitely in ventral because I want to connect with you and um, But but there's also, um, do you know IBS? Yeah. Yeah, irritable bowel syndrome, right? That's I've heard yeah. that's also to do with when you are in one of the activated. Maybe you can say something more about that. But but that happens to me it, before every interview, whether it's in English or in Danish, mm. and you know, no matter how comfortable I feel, it just it happens that there's pressure on my stomach, and I have to go to the toilet. Yeah, and so it's not completely safe, right? There's a mix, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I talked about these in pretty flat, like cartoony, one-dimensional terms. You know, safety, flight, fight, shutdown, freeze. Like, just you exist in this or you don't. But that's that's not that's not the reality of it. The reality of it is that pretty much all of these states, the primary states at least, the um, safety, flight, fight, and shutdown, these are pretty much active all the time. So right now I have most mostly access to my safety state and I can give it a number. I can say like I'm 90% in my safety state. I'm just making up a number right. just to say like to you know highlight that, you know, I'm good. Mm. Right. But actually it's probably a little more like, let's say, let's say 75%. Let's say mm. 70 to make my math easier. Mm. We'll say 70% uh, safety state, but I'm also sitting in a chair. So I'm immobile. So uh, you could argue that maybe my dorsal state, the shutdown state's kind of active, but I don't know. I mean, it is, I'm immobile, but you could also argue that I'm pretty animated. My arms are moving. I'm talking pretty quickly. I'm uh, breathing kind of short in my chest, 
my mouth is going dry. These are all signs that I'm in some kind of flight fight, not fight, but more like flight, some kind of flight activation. So let's say I'm 70% safety, but then I have 15 flight and 15 shutdown. And again, I'm just picking up numbers, but they're all active. You know what I mean? So it's not just someone's accessing their safety. It's not like I'm a hundred percent in my safety state. The, I think the more activation you have of safety, we can still notice the other states, but it'll be more from interest or compassion or curiosity, and it won't be out of control. So the more we get into flight fight or shutdown, then those other things like, you know, bowel symptoms, those might show up. Um, yeah, because... Or for like, for, like for me, my, my mouth is going dry, so I have mm-hmm. enough flight activation the further I go into flight. I'm, I might just like lose my critical thinking and just sort of like go blank, you know? Uh-huh. And so does this have to do, the reason we can't just be in safety and we call it the ventral vagus system, is it because there is something in me that knows that there's risk here and I'm not completely safe? And even though a more adult part of me would say, you know, you're actually completely safe. No, it's not because of trauma, it's just... Okay. It, the body's not designed to be 100% and in, in, I don't think designed or evolved to to be in 100% of the all these states have a function we talk about them in terms of the the emotional impact of these states and the behavioral impact but these states serve different functions so our ventral vagal state feels like you know joy or awe or connection or it leads to intimacy, it leads to meditation and stuff, right? But it also is just the biology that helps us, like we, we can't smile without it. We can't, you know, turn our neck mm-hmm. and whatnot in the same way without it. Um, or we can't, you know, list, t- tilt our head to the side when we're listening to someone. Like our our shutdown system, we talk about it in terms of collapse and dissociation, but it also has a lot to do with our our gut and just digestion and whatnot. So it's the all these things have a functional purpose, like they have to be active on to some degree all the time. So they're the real I don't think there is such a thing as a hundred percent safety. If that was true, then our ventral vagal state would be active completely, and then our dorsal vagal state wouldn't. And so what would that mean for our physical health? Like it probably wouldn't be very we wouldn't be able to fall asleep. We we have to shut down. We have to immobilize to fall asleep. We have to have access to flight fight in order to play with each other, to be mobilized. We have to have flight fight to feel motivated and create a podcast. Like there's no such thing as 100% safety. We can talk about it in those terms. It's easier, Mm. but realistically, that's not, you'd be sacrificing a lot, I think, to be in this complete state of, I don't even know what the heck it would be. (laughs) Just like constant awe and wonderment and feeling small and connected to the universe. Like that might be this incessant, you know, ventral vagal state, maybe, so but I, I, I have a hard time even conceptualizing what that would be in all honesty. No, the, okay. we, we have to have these states. Yeah. You know, it's not just, we, we think about them in terms of functioning and that's fine, but no, there, there is no such thing as hundred percent safety. I don't think. And so is it a matter of, yeah, you're talking about percentages. So, so if someone yeah. is, is too sympathetically activated, then that, that's the issue, right? If you're like constantly looking for danger, even though you are safe, then that's the problem. Then you just need more of the the ventral to balance it out. Yeah, unless you're actually in danger. <laughs> yeah. You need to run away or fight. Yeah. If you're in actual danger, then you should probably utilize the activation, right? Yeah. But, you know, if, for right now, if, if you and I had too much flight, flight activation, like if my flight activation turned into actual anxiety and... I wasn't able to do this with you, then I would probably need to say, hey, let's take a break here real quick. Let me go move around, drink some water, take a deep breath, extend my exhale, fidget with something maybe, um, give my kids a hug, just do something to alleviate my flight activation, but also anchor more deeply into my safety state. And then I come back here and be like, sorry about that. I'm good now. I had some water. I did this. I did I did that. And now I'm more functional and able to stay present and, and engage with you and, and do this. Yeah. So you're saying. So yeah, you need to you need to balance it out with safety. You're saying unless we are in danger, and this is where I think it really becomes interesting for people who 
you know, into therapy is mm. when it is, you are not in danger, but it is your neuroception, like not your perception, but your nervous system's perception is is telling you something is, yeah, it's scary, even though it's not. Yeah, and so danger that we evolved to neurocept and shift it, you know, into our, our danger states and react to was like, you know, the stereotypical tiger, you know, stepping on a twig and you hear it and, you know, you go into a little, little freeze and then boom, you know, take off with some flight activation maybe. Uh, you know, we don't have that day to day, but mm. I we are going to release this to people that could judge us. And that sounds, it's not dangerous, literally, but we neurocept that as danger in a sense because that's rejection. Yeah. So, yeah, it's still kind of dangerous. And so we're, in a way, not literally to our physical health, right? Yeah. But although at the same time, if you get enough rejection and social ostracization, that does affect you on a physical level. So it looks different, but yeah, we're still picking up on potential danger. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, I want to get into our little uh, game, my little game. It's gonna okay. you're you're the participant in it. Okay, so <laughs> the receiver of the game. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're the content creator. Otherwise, I don't know what to do for the rest of the hour. Um, okay, <laughs> so you're gonna get a topics here and tell me how how you can see um, you know polyvagal theory underneath this state. So. Uh, the topic of HDHD or neurodiversity altogether. How, how, what do you say? <laughs> a few points about that in terms of purely. I don't know what neurodiversity means anymore. I'll, I'll say that. Um, I did actually I, met someone recently. It's, I've chosen it's... the topics from topics you have treated in your own podcast. So you cannot say you don't know the answers because you have talked about it in your own podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, <laughs> right. But even in my podcast, there's a lot of. You know, it's not just a flat answer. I don't view these things the same way other people do. Neurodiversity, th this is the disclaimer. I don't know what that means anymore because it's so widely used. It's like using the word narcissism. Not everyone can be a narcissist. So at some point, it's just like, I don't know what you mean anymore. Right. It just can't be that case. I'm sorry, it can't. Mm -hmm. Neurodiversity, as I learned recently, is not a medical diagnosis. So I don't know how exactly where it came from. I don't know where how it got popularized, but it is this. It's just a, it's something that seems to be in everyone's bio and their TikTok and Instagram bios. So I, I don't know what it means. It I, I don't know anymore. You know, so like there, there's my disclaimer. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay, HDHD that is a medical diagnosis, right? ADHD is yeah. Yeah. That's a yeah. It is. We can take that. We can take that alone. Okay. So ADHD, same thing. Yeah. I don't know what this means okay. anymore. There's what it says in the DSM, and I can, you know, classify someone as meeting a certain number of diagnostic criteria. But again, the way we use it day to day is is not that. The way we use it day to day is well, ADHD people have difficulty with um, time or uh, frustration or this or that. And it's like, okay, well, what does it not mean at this point? And I don't know what it doesn't mean. So neurodiversity. ADHD is folded in there, trauma is folded in there, autism spectrum is folded in there. And I've seen a whole bunch of other stuff just like, yeah, this is neurodiversity. And it's like, well, what, I don't know what neurotypical would be at this point. I, who does not fit into these criteria on some level? That's kind of my question. So with ADHD, let's, let's get back to the root of what you're asking here. I want to respect that. <laughs> with ADHD, what we're doing is no one is examining someone's brain and saying, oh, this, you have this thing we call ADHD. There, there's no ADHD that I understand it. There's no thing called ADHD that is afflicting someone and resulting in a behavior. I don't look at it that way. I don't understand it that way. The idea is that if you want to look at it, I think there's like a chemical imbalance or brain is wired in some fashion and it results in these behaviors. Mm. But in the DSM, all it lists are the behaviors. It lists the outward projections of, it, not of, it lists these behaviors, period. Mm -hmm. That's that's really kind of it mm -hmm. from based on my memory. And we look at, oh, you have this and you have this and you have this. We will classify you as with ADHD. But that's where it kind of gets lost because it's turned into this medical model of, oh, you have this thing called ADHD, mm -hmm. which results in these behaviors. 
but really the DSM is saying, here's a list of behaviors you meet, you know, three out of five or whatever it is, we'll call this ADHD. So if we just look at the behaviors that can come from anywhere, you know what I mean? If someone is having difficulty focusing, if someone is having tons of mobilization in their body, if someone's having, you know, whatever the diagnostic criteria are that I can't remember off the top of my head, if someone has that, well, is that because of this thing called ADHD or is that because they have too much flight activation in their body and they simply can't sit still and they can't think, um, they can't focus on what's being taught or the objective in front of them because they their body's prepared to get up and run away from a danger, which probably isn't there in that moment. So it's, exactly. is it an ADHD, like you have this thing called ADHD and therefore you can't sit still or you can't sit still and we're seeing that and now we're going to call it ADHD. But really what's happening underneath what we're calling ADHD, oh, you have too much flight activation or you have too much anxiety within you. Mm. And, and that results in this thing that we're calling ADHD. So the way I view things and the way I treat my clients is if we can balance it out with more cues of safety, I call them, mm. then the ADHD or whatever else the diagnosis is should resolve. And that's kind of what I see in my practice. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you say it can stem from everywhere, but the way that you view it, is that correct that that is from a nervous system standpoint? That's how I view it. Yeah. 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 So that is what is really, I really, it's so fascinating about you, how you can do that. Like, because then it, everything can in a way relate to this and it's, yeah. and I love that. I'm also really fascinated by the way, by the polyvagal, pol, pol, polyvagal theory, because not least because it, lessens the shame if not right. takes it completely away from for example being a child who's who's you know constantly being not a fit to the school system and then yeah you can view it like that that what were you saying you were saying it's uh, immobilized where where is it on the ladder if you have hdhd It depends on the behaviors of what we're calling ADHD right. and the flavor of them. So let's let's paint a picture of two different kids in a classroom, yeah. okay? Yeah. Let's say we have a kid in a classroom who has more anxiety and you know wide-eyed and having trouble focusing. They want to get up and go to the bath, not go to the, they want to run to the bathroom just to escape and close the door and just hyperventilate and breathe, right? Yeah. That kid's probably more in a flight activation. So yeah. I would look at that and say, oh, you have this thing called ADHD and you have to deal with this the rest of your life. Here's, let me get you some medication uh, referral and hey, good luck. Um, instead, I would say, oh, what's happening within you? Yeah, You feel anxiety before you do this behavior. You feel anxiety, let's spend more time with that. What does that feel like? How do we balance it out with safety? Mm -hmm. And then we'll reassess in a week or whatever, right? Mm. So, so yeah, that, that's that's kid number one. Kid number two, let's paint this picture of someone who is also wide-eyed and tense. Heartbeat is up, really tense. They are sweaty palms, maybe, but they're not getting up and running. They're just kind of there and like they're on edge. They're hypervigilant. So we could look at that kid and say, well, there's some elements of ADHD here. They're not paying attention. They, they seem really wound up, um, but but there's something else going on here. They kind of have flight activation, but they're also presenting differently. Like they're kind of immobile at the same time. So they're really wound up, but they're not, they're not exactly mobile. So yeah. that kid might have more freeze activation that's flavored by flight. So shut down in flight that's a, at the same time. So a more yeah. panicky kind of flavor to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're not going to make a big deal out of it. Typically like kids or teens at least try to hide this stuff. So it might not be obvious on the outside. And so we might just say, well, you're having trouble focusing and your socialization is not that great. And you seem to be, uh, I don't know, have a hard time remembering stuff and just, you know, you're not quite present. So yeah, therefore ADHD, but really it's underneath it might be they're constantly in this flight activation or panicky freeze activation. And that's probably has a lot to do with home. So we could have a similar, we could have the same diagnosis that fits different um flavors of or different clients basically and those clients will have their own unique nervous system state and we could talk about them in generalities but when you get specific oh. then it starts to the idea of oh you have adhd that, that kind of breaks down 
And when you see two different kids that have two different states, Can but you... similar appearances and similar uh, functional obstacles, then it, it, I think the idea of diagnosis kind of it, it breaks down. So you're saying it can actually be very unique? I think so, yeah. Uh, okay. Th through the lens of the polyvagal theory, yeah. 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 And you could totally have a kid that's sitting there just angry and pissed off. All right. And he's not going to pay, he or she's not going to pay attention. Yeah. They're going to be way more worried about well, who, this person's judging me, this person's staring at me. Yeah. yeah you know? Yeah, so yeah. they're in class, they're sitting still, but whew, they are not present. They are not focused. They're not listening. They're not retaining information. Mm -hmm. But they're also not anxious. They're more fight, uh, angry fight activation. I was but on, from the outside looking in, you might say, oh, look, this kid's having a hard time paying attention. The socialization is, is you know, having a hard time and blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Therefore, ADHD. But I was a complete no. shutdown as a child. Uh, so that I relate very much to that dorsal state. Yeah. I'm not sure about the blend of it. I would have to go back in time to check. But um, but what I'm curious about is also, you know, adults, 40 plus women are getting that diagnosis a lot. And so does that also relate to the nervous system? Because it's like you get this diagnosis and then it's like, now I understand what has been going on with me for so long. Is it still the nervous system, the, do you think? The, yeah, the nervous system's always going. It's always present. It's always these polyvagal shifts are always shift, shifting. Yeah, it would have shifted. Uh, the polyvagal states, I'm sorry, they're always shifting. Yeah, even right now, like, I feel myself getting more and more flight activation. I'm still present. I'm still fine. I'm still in my safety state, but I'm still I'm more mobilized than I was before. Oh, no. You know, so... <laughs> Are you okay? Go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> okay. yeah I, I think the, these discussions like excite me. And so right. I feel like, right. oh, I'm into this, you know? Yeah, okay. So whether or not we want it to, stuff, our, our state shifts all the time based on just normal day-to-day -day stuff, but also based on the context of our life. So if if you have... If you have a fulfilling life and then you have some sort of debilitating medical thing happen, you're probably not going to have as much access to your safety state, your, your capacity for happiness and fulfillment. And, you know, it's, it's going to be challenged at the very least. That's not a, it's not a, I don't think something requires like a diagnosis. It's like, oh, your life context changed, which dramatically, or if you lose someone, like, my God. It's going to affect your state. But like no my, how old my you, question is, if you got your state. if you got the diagnosis as an adult, and then you you kind of go back in time in your mind and say, "Oh, I've had this the whole time," but wouldn't your state have shifted then? Not necessarily, no. Okay. Well, I, we're talking in generalities again, right? So, yes. if someone is raised and they live in a more of like a dorsal vagal shutdown state, that necessarily that won't necessarily, that might become their, what Deb Dana calls a home away from home. Yes. That's like their dominant state. So remember, all these states are active all the time to some level. But your dominant state, the one that's really like the driving force of your life, that might be one state that stays present throughout your life until you you do more self-regulation practices, trauma recovery practices, and self-development, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So I lived in predominantly dorsal vagal shut down a lot of my life. Okay. Right. As I continue to do my own work, it's less and less and less flavored by my shutdown. I still love my shutdown state. <laughs> I do really well by myself, you know, but way more capacity for mobilization, for fight energy, for uh, motivation and accomplishing things. Whereas before, it was kind of there, but not not quite. It was it was a lot different. Mm -hmm. So, to get let me try to get back to your question. Your question was, wouldn't it shift throughout life? Not necessarily. Right. If if you, especially if you do things that we call behavioral adaptations, if you do things that really solidify your state. So if you are raised and grow up with more of a, let's say a fight, flight fight state, if you turn to self-harm, if you turn to drug use, all kinds of addictions, then those addictions or those negative coping skills, we'll call them, those will solidify your state. You're not going to, hmm. it'll solidify your dominant state. You're not necessarily going to self-regulate out of that hmm. until 
you reduce the skip the behavioral adaptation and increase the level of safety activation within you then self-regulation can happen then that polyvagal ladder climbing can still happen so even though we have a dominant flavor or dominant state to our lives throughout life it it, that dominant flavor can totally change Mm -hmm. that's what i do in therapy like it, it totally can change but we'll still have moments of connection and safety and flight by like we'll still access these things but the dominant one the undercurrent of who you are and how you interact with the world that can very much stay at a plateau for your whole life it can unless i mean because you were saying because of the behavior because that is perpetuating it that solidifies it that reinforces so it, it reinforces it but you know yeah. growing up it's not like someone was born addicted to some, well i guess that literally could happen but to, you know if someone could be born in a home where it's you know good enough parenting yeah you know their needs are taken care of but they're lacking meaningful emotional connection like you know they're being taken care of the parents are there mm. but that emotional connection is not developed so they're literally safe but they're not getting that that next level of what we call co-regulation and connection and safety you know so that kid who has good enough upbringing darn it I lost ask what was your question <laughs> What was the question well, bringing just, back to the... Just that the behavior is reinforcing Thank you. that home Thank away you. from home. Yeah. So that kid is going to be raised with, you know, they're, they're good enough parenting. Maybe they grow up just kind of feeling just this general sense of aloneness. So there's enough kind of dorsal vagal shutdown present in their system to to notice. It's there. It's not their driving force, but it's it's there. Ideally, what we do as well throughout life is that we notice how we feel, feel it, from compassion, from our safety state, and uh, climb our polyvagal ladders into more safety state. But instead of doing that, what we often do is we have some sort of behavioral adaptation. So instead of feeling my loneliness and my my underlying sense of disconnection, I'll instead turn to overeating. That makes me feel better. Okay. So if I do that, then my sense of loneliness and disconnection, which is not maybe debilitating, but it's there then that just nothing changes it it just kind of stays there and throughout life that might be that might flavor my or contribute to the decisions that i make in life mm-hmm. once i take away my negative coping mechanism whatever that is like overeating yeah then or finding bad relationships or you know the list goes on and on right once i take that away then that underlying dysregulation disconnection loneliness whatever it is that's probably going to surface and so it that can be overpowering, it can be a lot. And so we need to prioritize and balance it out with more safety activation. That is And so if we can do that, good. then then true self-regulation can occur. Ah, right. This is so good. Okay, so because probably we we're not very aware of that. We leave that relationship, we finally stop overeating and whatever coping we had, we finally stopped doing that and then we don't I mean, of course you can you can expect some kind of um, um, reaction to stopping that, but still, from from what you're just saying, then actually now we have to deal mm. with what we didn't feel before. So, so where are we on the ladder if we stop? Let's say we were stopping some addiction. Where are we on the ladder then? It kind of depends on. I mean, very generally speaking, it depends yeah. on where you started. Yeah. So, I had a session recently where. The guy was raised in one of those homes where it was good enough parenting. Yeah. Parents were there, good enough. But mm. the emotional connection wasn't there. Mm. And so what could that result in? Well, let me take a step back. So later on in this in life, like decades later, this guy, his life context abruptly changes. Mm. And throughout his life for decades, he had had a couple of coping skills that were not negative. They were actually pretty good. But um, they abruptly were not an option. So all the the decades worth of coping he did all of a sudden are like now in his face. Like, hey, you can no longer escape and distract yourself from what's happening within. And boom, here you go. Now you got to feel it. Okay, so where would someone like that be on their ladder? What state? It, It could be any of them. It could be flight, fight. It could be shut down. You were saying like there's something that you have not been feeling, right? Mm-hmm. 
and you've covered that up with numbing out. Mm -hmm. Potentially numbing out, yeah. So, but yeah. So well, it could be it could be numbing out. It could be distracting. It could mm -hmm. be ignoring. It could be minimizing. We do all kinds of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, but actually, we are in the middle of a quiz, and I've just. <laughs> I've just lost myself the from conversation talking took us to I, I did. One of them is actually addiction, but uh, I wanted, I'm, I'm going to do it in selected order because I know we're probably not going to go through them all. I want to know about bipolar because you have an episode on that that takes you through a lot of topics. So that's really awesome. So just in general, bipolar and, and polyvagal states, what do you say? A problem with all these diagnoses. Um, it's another very that one seems to be less popular recently, but that was like a decade ago when I was in the county mental health. That was very, very, very popular. Okay, so what's the general idea of bipolar? It's um it's periods of time where you have high activation and impulsivity, and periods of time where you have pretty much the opposite and isolation and low activation, just to yeah. put it super simply. So, what state could those be? That could be with a couple options here. It could be flight fight for the high activation, and that could be shut down for the low activation. But what's driving that? Is that someone that who lives chronically in a shutdown state? And so let me, let me pause here. Bring, bring me back to this point if, if you can remember it. The body is always trying to self-regulate. Mm. As mammals, as, as organisms, the body always strives for homeostasis. It always strives for optimal biological functioning. Survival. And we're in our safety state, that is that pro that provides us with optimal biological functioning. It is it, it's home like we we need that mm -hmm. for yeah. I don't want to repeat myself. But we need that. Okay. So we're mm -hmm. always striving. The body is always striving for Humostasis. more safety in the system. It's always striving for self regulation. So yeah. let me. I'll bring it back to where I where I had paused. If someone is existing in a defensive state, their body always wants to self-regulate and get to homeostasis to get to balance. We do things like I mentioned before, like behavioral adaptations that cut that process off. That we, you know, we we become addicted to stuff or turn to uh, you know bad relationships that end up reinforcing the state and don't help us to self-regulate and to get to homeostasis because that's difficult. Okay, so someone who's in shutdown, they, just like anybody else, need to self-regulate. When they come out of shutdown, they're going to go into fight, fight, flight. That process is not comfortable. It is often overwhelming. You have to have your safety state developed enough to tolerate and welcome that fight activation and then flight and then deeper into safety. So when you come out of, or when one comes out of shutdown into fight flight, that often can be very overwhelming. And instead of mindfully experiencing and allowing it, they take that activation and they use it for other things. Excuse me. They use it for other things like, I don't know, shopping sprees, uh, drug use, making poor decisions in relationships, yes. uh, all kinds Fighting. of stuff. Yeah. So that goes nowhere and ends up reinforcing the shutdown. So to me, when I hear bipolar, I hear shutdown and sympathetic. Mm -hmm. So I, I hear someone who's struggling and probably going back and forth between shutdown and sympathetic. That's mm -hmm. one possibility. Mm -hmm. The other possibility is we have someone who is in freeze. So freeze is a combination of shutdown and sympathetic. But when freeze is activated, it looks like panic or rage. Or um, it depends on the flavoring of the sympathetic. So if it's flight plus shutdown, that's panic. If it's fight plus shutdown, that is could be explosive rage. So do we have someone that is diagnosed as bipolar, but really they are stuck chronically in this fre uh, freeze? And then we see moments of intense isolation and cutting people out of their life, which is probably more shutdown flavor, but it's freeze. And then we see moments of intense activation mm -hmm. that looks like anger or maybe panic. 
and it's more flight or fight flavored. So, and then they go right back down into that freeze. So to me that we could call that bipolar on the outside looking in or just from the outside looking at behaviors, we might say, oh, you have this thing called bipolar disorder. But if we were looking at the nervous system and the state and, and those shifts that are happening, or if that person were to tell us on a deeper level, what, this is how this is what's happening within me. When I do that thing, that manic behavior, this is what's happening within. And when I do that thing, it feels better. It doesn't fix it, but it feels better. But then I feel terrible about myself and I feel ashamed and I just want to go isolate and be, be alone. And But then all of a sudden I feel this thing again. And so it's like this, the body's attempting to self-regulate, but it goes right back into its dysregulation. It makes so a lot of I sense. would call that bipolar disorder yeah. that's how i look at things yeah no i love that that's why i'm asking you this um i'm curious why you get so upset about the diagnosis <laughs> but I, because but it's I, judgmental it, inherently i think it's judgmental and it, it yeah. puts people like me are you are you a licensed therapist also i'm a nam therapist and i'm studying to become a okay. psychotherapist yeah sweet so that gives us way too much power i believe i i don't want to have the power to diagnose mm -hmm. i think it's judgmental it is even though there's been a huge push for like anti-stigma it's um i don't think that i don't think diagnosis goes hand in hand with that personally um but like now you have that philosophy now you have this these theories that are explaining it so you yeah. get the diagnosis and then you just convert it and then you understand it in a different way right yeah and i think the way the polyvagal way is more compassionate personally i think there's more hope in there mm. because what well, so part of diagnosis what it's become is a permanent thing about a person yeah you are people say i am adhd like yeah. it's a part it's a core of who i am i am fill in the blank mm. or you are this way narcissistic usually you are that way and so it's it's become a defining piece of someone's character versus a temporary state based on the context of their life. And so I, when I heard, I, I've never looked at my clients that way. It's never made sense for me that a, a kid who's labeled with ADHD mm -hmm. can behave one way in a classroom, mm -hmm. but then one-on-one -on -one with me, they are a completely different kid. I'm like, well, what happened to this permanent thing? Where did it go? It doesn't make sense to me. So it, that's why I get upset about it. It's yeah. all those reasons. Yeah. Um, but when we look at it as we, all of us, are a product of the context of our life, yeah. Um, there's way more hope in there because that means, well, first off, any of us can be, we, and we do. We all of us have some level of defensive activation and maybe even dysregulation, but it's it's temporary. And for the vast, like I don't know about there's certain some things I don't know about like schizophrenia i'm not an expert in that that's probably different autism spectrum is probably different i don't but i, I wouldn't look at that as a disorder personally either mm -hmm. but like when we look at things in a more polyvagal informed way that nest we have to look at it as a temporary state yeah someone is temporarily maybe a long time maybe it's a long temporary fair enough but like someone who's in shutdown is not necessarily permanently in shutdown. It might be there for quite a while, sure. It might have been there for quite, for decades, but there's things we can do yeah. realistically that to come out of shutdown. You don't have to to be. experience more safety, yeah. to experience yeah. more mobilization, more play, more you know, like that's part of the equation of polyvagal theory is this is now a possible yeah. it's included, like it's baked in. This is you're stuck temporarily. It's not a permanent diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's something you can do, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, there's something Absolutely. you can do about it. Yeah, that's that's the hope part of it. Yeah. No, I get you. I'm totally with you on that with the diagnosis system because the problem is the that you identify with it, right? Like yeah. You said it becomes. Yeah. Powerful. So um, part of yeah. the anti-stigma stuff, like I think it's resulted in, in part, is now no, it's okay that you are this way. Yeah. Versus. Dude, all of us can exist and feel these things. It's not permanent. Yeah. Like, we we could do something about this. That's a hell of a lot different than no. It's okay that you're this way. Mm. Period. Like, there's a period at the end of that. You know what I mean? There's no. That's yeah. not much of a guiding light there. I don't. I don't like that. No. Okay, you're gonna get. It's very top down. It's very like I'm the yeah. expert, and I'm telling you there's something wrong with you. 
and here it is and good I, luck I for think, the rest of your life here's some coping skills like i don't i don't like that i think we tend to take it though even though maybe someone in the beginning told us then it's like yeah it's a match because i feel something has been wrong with me for a long time right and that's the yeah. same part of it so this is yeah, much more objective kind of point of view with polyvagal theory it's more you know it's biology <laughs> Yeah, it's. I think people are desperate for answers, mm. and getting a label feels like an answer. Yeah, you know, but it's, but then, it, but along with that comes, well, this is how I am. Period. Yeah. Versus polyvagal theory, and I don't want to limit to polyvagal theory, but like I know polyvagal theory brings this answer, and it's like here's oh here's why and. Yeah. So here, this you're oh you're in a shutdown state. Like yeah, it makes sense based on the context of your life. And guess what? You can access more safety. Yeah. And it, there's no right answer for one. Every all of us, it looks safety looks different for all of us. Mm. And what we're pulled toward, it, it's different for each of us. So it's not a crisp answer. But as far as like what to do about it, mm. but there is an answer of like, oh yeah, you, you live in shutdown. That makes sense based on your life context you couldn't run away from the thing you couldn't fight the thing off and now you exist in a shutdown state yeah that makes sense mm -hmm. the good news is we, there's things you can do to access more safety and as you do that should alleviate or to soften at the very least slight bite should come back in your system as that does access more safety soften that out and then you keep going and like there's a there's a roadmap great. a general roadmap great yes i want to get to at least one more of my okay um yeah, I don't know if it's it's not a diagnosis, but a condition you can be in is to ruminate. So rumination, thoughts just endlessly keep going, you're worried. And you also, I think it's connected to the feeling of having to be prepared, you know, that something can go wrong. That state, yeah. what do you say about that? I'm just noticing I access, I access some fight activation directly. <laughs> the diagnosis stuff. The is diagnosis like, stuff. Little, yeah. little fight activation. <laughs> good so okay rumination um i want to let's let's i'm gonna put this as a question for the listener when we're ruminating what's what's the what's the level of mobilization in rumination is it mm. collapsed and empty and numb or is rumination more fast-paced and is there energy in it versus not energy so if someone feels like they have, or if someone says that, hey, I ruminate a lot, the question for me is, what's the what's the activation of it? You know what I mean? And typically, I think rumination is going to be more high energy, more yeah. focused on like one thing, you know? Yeah, that's This what... person said this thing at work, or this person's acting yeah. this way, at, you know, or, or this, uh, the barista had this attitude, and oh, I can't get this out of my mind. Yeah, there's you know, that, so... and then there's there's also it's also connected to to where what I feel in clients and in myself, of course, is you know I have to do the all of these things. I have to be, you know, I have to do all the things all the time, mm. and and of course I don't do I can't do all the things that I want to do, and then get worried like then I you know I should have oh. done all the th keeps going, and it's it's very self critical mm -hmm. and but it's but it, the, it's defending, a, it's like a part that's defending itself by saying. Otherwise, you're just gonna you're gonna waste your life. You know? <laughs> Do you know what part I mean? Well, <laughs> yeah. So let's tease out the pieces of this. Yeah. Uh, typically, we we think that our thoughts cause our anxiety, and of, of course, it contributes to it. Of course, but the primary mover, in my opinion, is not the th cognition, the thoughts. The primary mover is is your state. So with overthinking or rumination or hyper focusing on one thing one aspect of whatever mm. that probably comes from flight fight I, I would or freeze so if it, but it depends on the flavor of the thoughts so if your thoughts are aggressive like i can't believe this person did this to me and how dare he that doctor diagnosed that kid oh i'm so enraged i can't get it out of my mind that's that's me mm -hmm. like that would be that's that could be rumination, but that would come from fight activation. And so rather than feeling my fight activation mindfully and with compassion and softening it with the safety state, I just kind of stay stuck in it. And then my thoughts and and then my thoughts change. I want to highlight that. The the state is there, and then my thoughts become 
angry and fixated and I ruminate because the state's not changing. So my thoughts just stay the way they are. And if the thought, if the thoughts don't change, then my state doesn't change either because it's, it's reinforcing it. So it's, it's like this vicious cycle really, um, that keeps us stuck in our state. But if our thoughts, if our ruminating thoughts are more about the next day, well, I got to do this and I got to do that. And well, if this goes wrong and oh my God, I didn't do this thing. That's probably, more. Okay. I think rumination probably has some level of immobility because you're like, you can't do anything about it. You're stuck in it. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's like an end, endless cycle of what you yeah. just, and, but, and you have this slogan that story follows state. Yeah. That's Deb Dana. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The yeah. thoughts in our brain come from the state of our body, the stories in our brain, the cognitions, they come from the state of our body. Yeah. Yeah. So you, yeah. you have to give us some kind of solution here. What to do about it? Well, the what I like to recommend to people as like a first line of offense, offense is to uh, well, there's a couple a couple things going through my mind. Validate what you're going through. That mm. just means acknowledging it. Just mm. I think that's kind of a big part of this. So if you were in therapy for I don't know anxiety. Well, you've already, you've already validated it. You're already going to therapy and you're saying, I have problems with anxiety. So validate it. Mm. But when you call it, and look, I don't want to tell people how to, you and your diagnoses are between you and your doctors, which is my opinion. I have no idea what's going on with any one individual, individual person. But when we, I believe that when we say I have an anxiety disorder or I have ADHD or I have this or that, or the other thing, I believe that invalidates our true felt experience. So I don't know if those go hand in hand very well. So what I would encourage people to do is validate no matter the source of it. Just say, if you have anxiety, just acknowledge, I feel really anxious mm -hmm. or in my life, I have felt a lot of anxiety. That's it. Mm -hmm. So validate it, then normalize it. And that means make sense of it. That means asking yourself, does it make sense why I feel anxiety? Mm -hmm. And that might be present day, like this idiot at work is doing this or that. It could be my parents did weren't the best, and now I feel just constant anxiety. So yeah, I yeah, saw my but, mom acting this way, or my dad acting this way, or but felt you said that, that home was unsafe. It starts with the nervous system, right? So it's not Say because of, but it's not because of what happened, right? It's not because of what you're thinking. It's because of the state that that's how it starts. It it's comes like, from the state, but yeah. the state comes from other contexts. Okay. You know? Okay, the state comes from other yeah. life situations, what you yeah. grew up in. Oh, yeah, okay. present and past, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but changing state is always up to us, up to the individual, no matter, I'll, I'll, I'll say no matter our context, um, ultimately it comes to us, up to us mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to change our state, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, validate, normalize, which means just does, does it make sense based on my life? Yeah. And if you can't give an answer to that, um, ask yourself, if someone that I loved came to me and told me, I feel really anxious and here's what's happening. Would you say to them, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> That's it's normal yes. you feel that way. Yeah. And then after you can validate and normalize, then the next thing would be give yourself permission to have that feeling without labeling it, without making it go away, without trying to make yourself feel better. Just let it be there. While you do that, also do something that feels grounding and safe. It could be using your senses. It could be music. It could be, it could be a lot of things, things that feel safe and present in that piece of normalizing do you use the nervous system to have like green red yellow and a mixture of them is that a part of normalizing to talk about the nervous system or you don't do that it can be i don't talk about the color thing no. but okay. um because i think it adds a layer that's not necessary but yeah you, you can you, you totally could uh say you know you feel anxiety and this is if someone's kind of you know bought into or or not bought into but is in agreement with the polyvagal lens right mm. if if we're both using the same language then we could totally say oh you feel anxiety does it make sense why you feel anxiety yeah I've, this thing happened and it took me out of my safety state and i i feel really mobilized so yeah it shows up with anxiety that makes sense mm. now can you give yourself permission to feel more mobilized mm. like yeah i can cool let's, now let's do let's use a fidget kind of balance it out so yeah you could totally use that language nice 
Nice. Okay. Yeah. I think. Ah, oh, I think also maybe you can get scared of yourself. That's even an extra layer, right? That you can like. Oh no! Now I'm in this state, and then layers of this stuff. Like yeah. if the idea of someone trying to look inward and notice their shutdown or notice their numbness or their heaviness might feel like way too much. And so rather than doing that and going way deep into feeling numb and empty, we got to first feel that apprehension, that mild fear, that mild freeze activation that just came up within you as you just thought about feeling your shutdown. So there's, there's like layers to this stuff. And if you can do the first layer, then all right, cool. Okay, now can we get to the next layer? Just whatever the, the priority, the way I work is whatever the emotion is in the present moment, that's, that's the priority. So if we're talking about something uncomfortable from the past, we're not going to delve further into the past. Mm. Let's talk about right now. Where are you at right now? How does it feel right now? Yeah. Yeah, me too. And balance it out with safety. Yeah, amazing. Okay. I'm mindful of the time. Um, sure. Yeah, so I'm going to shut it down and you. We, I have to get you back if you want to take the further into the quiz. But um, but I do have a minute and uh, uh, I just want to say something about your astrology because I know, because I know you really love all the alternative explanations like that. You do? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, yeah. I was making a joke. Uh, I I did I did see one of it your. It took me a while to yeah to realize you're being sarcastic. I love it. Thank you. One of your chapters is like there's no parts, there's no this or that, there's no, no shadow, there's just biology or something. And so because so. of that, because I know that about you, you know, I focused on well, you are an Aquarius, so that is a very a, a very logical sign, and you have most air. Uh, so that is very logical, and um, but also your Mercury, which is how how you learn, how you navigate through life, and your Mercury. What is Mercury? What does that mean? Your Mercury means how you navigate through your life, and then it depends how it is in your chart, what sign it's in, how how it's configured um, in relationship okay. to the other planets. So everyone has a Mercury, right? And yours is oh, okay. in Pisces. So Pisces is this great mystery. And and so there are all these puzzles to life, right? And when you have Mercury in Pisces, it can it's really nice to feel I ha there's a logical explanation for all the mystery of life. Yeah. And like the whole the maze of life. I can see my way I can orient through that. Some kind yeah. of logic piece. Yeah. Like make sense of it. Yeah. Sort of, yeah, gotcha, totally. Exactly. And so, so that is, that is really amazing. And you're doing a great job of it. So of is that, do that. I fit into, based on the information I've given you, yeah. do I fit into those? Unfortunately, what you're saying? unfortunately, you fit perfect into your birth chart. <laughs> because it, it is, sounds like me, yeah. It does sound like you, right? It's very, it is logic. And, and then, of course, there's also this, um, there's a great publicist in you. Mm. Um, so I reckon right now you have, you're very busy because you've mentioned that yeah. in your podcast, <laughs> you're very busy. And so, but, if, but if there's a time later on where you're not as busy, you can publish even more, you know, you can, yeah, you can write more if you want to too. And, but you have a lot going on as well, but that's, yeah. that's because of, there's different signatures. I'm saying that from both the Mercury, but also your, your moon and Neptune in Sagittarius and your whole, your 12th house. And then, okay, I'll say one more thing. Your Aquarius, it's conjunct your South yeah. node. It's, it is really that feeling that you come into this life and you need to, you have a purpose and you really need to, to make it this time, this time around. How do you feel about cool. all of this? <laughs> How do I feel? Um, I feel interested and intrigued and... That's how I feel. Yeah. Good, good. But I'm loving the Aquarius because Aquarius is supposed to rebel and is supposed to say, you know, let's not do it in such a stupid, reducing Ouch. manner. Let's open up. Come on, people. So, yeah. I think that is a, a driving force of my life. I, I think I can balance it out with, like, as, as a therapist, that's my mindset. But I'm also very, I think, empathetic. And the way yeah. I'm talking right now is not how I talk as a therapist. But it's of course. unless I have a really mobilized client that I'm meeting uh, regardless. So the empathy yeah, to me is 
obviously important, right? Yeah. But to me, it's also part of the equation. <laughs> mm. Like it's part of the solution is, is empathy for ourselves and, and others as well. And like, I think there's a nice marriage between that emotional, empathetic compassion, but also what makes sense? What's the least restrictive path? What's, how do we listen to our values, you know, and, and like bring these together. And I think a lot of good can come from that in my, my um, therapy, my coursework, like all that stuff is a balance of those things. How do we solve a problem, but deeply connect with ourselves, you know, as part of part of that, like that, how do you, how do you get to the, the answer and like the equation, the stuff in the middle is the empathy and values and norms and context. Like how does that get to the result, you know? Yeah. So it's part, part of this bigger picture and Pisces, Mercury in Pisces is very, very compassionate. So it makes sense that that is absolutely part of the solution. And that's, I mean, that is what's driving your, when you like, you get excited is because of your compassion for, you know, yeah. Oh, yeah. kids and human beings. And so, yeah. Just in I, your, I, hmm? the, um, like you asked me, I'm sorry, one more thing, if, yeah. if I can, because you brought no, it up again. Absolutely. <laughs> The, the diagnosis stuff, part yeah. of what upsets me is that it, it's a limiter. Yeah. It's a cap. And I hate that. Yeah. I do not want to put limits on people mm -hmm. and to tell them, here's your cap. Like, here's your potential. I hate mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And even though we use these diagnoses and we don't mean that, that, that is the effect I believe. And it's, it seems readily apparent. And I work, when I work with people that don't have the a lot of my clients don't have the political information when they start. They're just people, you know, they're not mm -hmm. like my listeners. Exactly. They're just people that are looking for help. Yeah. And they carry around these little limiters of, oh, I am neurodivergent. I am ADHD. I am this, I am that. And it's, it's a cap. And so it's like, well, now we got to take this cap off. We have to take off this limiter. Mm -hmm. And then once we do that, it's like, oh, there's a pathway here. Yes. Like now we can start walking down the pathway. Yeah. That, that, so, upsets, that really upsets me. I, I hate the cap. And love the liberation, right? Love it. Love Taking it, love it, it love it. Yeah. Yep. That is the right word for it. <laughs> Good. Oh, man. Um, you were just saying, you, you did, do, do you want to say something about what you're doing right now, where people can find you? Absolutely, in the podcast, but you're also oh. doing like a course. Like I feel taking educations with you because I want to know all of those blended states and what to yeah, do about yeah. it. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm, I am doing everything. So uh, yeah, the best place to find me if you're interested in this stuff is just in lmft.com and I have all my resources and stuff. Um, I think the biggest thing that I'm working on right now that's causing, not, it, yeah, it is causing stress, but it's also driven by stress <laughs> is uh, my first book. It's called Stuck Not Broken, book one, trauma and the political paradigm. Books two and three are already written and they'll be out soon after. But that is the driving force besides family and, you know, other stuff. <laughs> Like that is the driving force of my life is getting this thing out and it should be out like within the week, like super soon. Oh my gosh. So, That's yeah. amazing. Because I saw something about a book, but I could not find it, Justin. So it's because it's not out yet. The, yeah. I have a free ebook. That's like the first draft of it. Okay. And that people can find that on my site. This though is it takes the ebook and expands it and folds it into It's just a bigger picture. That's so like, there's a free version. If you want to go read it, go read it. The more expansive, comprehensive thing is coming out. Uh, yeah, super soon. So that that's actually like a print book that you can buy. It'll that's be ebook version also, but the print book will come out very, very, very soon. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and I predicted yeah, really that. I predicted that, you know, <laughs> this is happening because of me. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> That's amazing, Jesse. I'm so happy because you're you're a great writer and oh, I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I will um cool. post all the links in the show notes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for, for this and all your work. I'll definitely also link to your podcast. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for giving me a, a pathway here to talk about things like I'm really passionate about and honestly kind of hold back on a lot. And I appreciate you opening up that that pathway for me. Thank you. Oh, man. Always, always. <laughs>